Thank you, Phil. So thanks for having me. And uh, I would also like to take this chance to thank the organizers of this HUM trimester program. Uh, I wish I were born right now. I heard that people had lots of fun. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Valentin, uh, uh, and also Farrell and Philip, uh, and Lillian, and also Marina. So uh, I would also like to take this chance to thank the Chinese University of Hong Kong because I will not be faculty there anymore uh, in a short period of time. So I, yeah, I just want to thank the teachers there who taught me and nourished me into who I am. And, yeah. All right. Okay, so you can see my screen, right? Yeah, so, um, in this talk, uh, the first goal we have is to compute something like the gradient of a function u in LP of Rn. Okay, so today n will be bigger than or equal to one. It is the dimension of the underlying Euclidean space, and we will have p that is between one and infinity uh, can be equal to one, but finite. So we want to compute the W1P norm of this function that is, let's say, smooth with complex support on Rn. So, in joint work with Pine Brassis and Sean Van Stappingen, we have established a new formula for these semi norms that involves um, only different quotients and no gradients. Now, of course, if you want to compute the gradient of U in LP, then one of the most natural things to do is to just compute the gradient first and integrate. But then we found a way that doesn't require you to take the limits of different quotient to get a gradient. You can just work with the great, uh, work with the different quotients themselves, and then we will be able to compute uh, the W1P seminal. So this is the first thing I would like to um, explain. Now this formula is motivated by certain weak LP estimates on the product space uh, R2N, which is the product of Rn with Rn. This is where the different quotients lives. Um, and this weak LP estimates on this product space would allow us to fix up certain galileo lierenberg interpolation inequalities that uh, fail. Um, these inequalities involve the space W11, uh, the space of functions whose gradient is in L1, and we will look at uh, how we fix those up. And then I will move on to some joint work with Tien Song Gu, uh, who uh, proved a similar formula for the LP norm of any function u in LP of Rn. So this time, not the gradient of u in LP, but just the LP norm of the function. And finally, we'd like to uh, mention some joint work uh, with uh, Andreas Sieger, Brian Street, and Sean Van Slappingen. So we studied some similar questions regarding fractional order best of spaces. And then these are natural questions that arise um, because they allow us to clarify the nature of the um, yeah, they had the Lehrer Burke interpolation inequalities that we fixed in uh, the, the two points above. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, I should say that you, you, uh, you should stop me for any questions. Now, this talk, will, uh, we will see a lot uh, of the interplay between LP and weak LP. So I thought I would just remind everybody, uh, like uh, the notion of weak LP on this one slide. Um, so if f is an LP function on Rn, where p is bigger than or equal to one and finite, you can calculate the p power of the LP norm by just integrating the function to the power p. And for every positive lambda, you would be able to bound this p power of the integral from below by lambda to the p times the measure of the sets of all x where the absolute value of x is bigger than lambda. So the measure of the super level set. So this is the uh, championship of inequality, but of course it's very elementary. And in particular, this shows that if I take um, lambda times the measure of the super level set to the power one over p and take the supremum over all positive lambda, this is going to be bounded above by the LP norm of your function. So if F is in LP, then the supremum is finite, but the converse is of course not necessarily true. Now, if F is a measurable function on Rn and the supremum here is finite, 
then we are going to say that LP is in weak LP. It's somewhat weaker than LP, but oh, well, this is weak LP. Okay, this weak LP norm is precisely the supremum here, and we will denote this uh, supremum here by um, F in LP comma infinity of RF. Um, well, I even included an example. If I take x to the power of minus n over p on Rn, then this is going to be in weak LP on Rn, uh, but not in strong LP, uh, because you can just calculate the size of the super level sets and you can integrate this function to the power p. So this is going to be a crucial example for us in a second. Uh, I thought I would bring this up. Okay, so. Here's the formula that I promised in the title. Um, suppose we are in Rn where n is bigger than u to one, uh, p bigger than u to one, but finite. And let's say u is smooth with complex of four on Rn. So let's just work with a priori inequalities um, today. Okay. We're going to look at a difference quotient like this that I denote by QU of xy which is defined on the product space Rn cross Rn, which is this R2n. So the first factor here is what you would think of as a difference quotient. You take Uy minus Ux uh, divided by Y minus X, and take the length of that. And um, when I say difference quotient, I want to modify, that is a modified difference quotient uh, in the sense that I would multiply also by this factor one over y minus x to the power um, n over p. So if I just combine the factors in the denominator, this is the modified difference quotient. And I'm going to use this difference quotient to compute my uh, LP norm of the gradient. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, for every positive lambda, I'm just going to define the super level sets of this modified difference quotient, the sets of all x, y's where this different quotient is bigger than lambda. Now, technically, Q of U and E lambda, they all depend on the dimension and the uh, exponent P that I'm working with, but let's suppress them for the moment. We think of them as fixed. Uh, it also depends on the function U and I'll also suppress that because let's think of the function as fixed. So if I take the super level sets of this modified difference quotient and I take this, you, uh, this uh, Lebesgue measure raised to power one over p. Multiply by lambda and let lambda tend to infinity. Okay. Then what I obtain is a quantity that is a fixed multiple of the LP norm of the gradient of u. This fixed multiple depends on the dimension n and the exponent p, but um, the uh, precise value is not very important. So I, I wrote it down here, but yeah, we will not use it today. Okay, so if I want to calculate the gradient of, L, uh, gradient of U in LP, I could, I could have taken this um, measure of this super level sets in the product space and then multiply by the height lambda and let lambda tend to infinity. All right, so below we discuss the heuristic proof of the theorem and more importantly, how we, uh, well, how this formula came by, like how one could think about such a formula if I uh, yeah, know that it works. But before that, uh, if I should pause and see whether you have any questions. Okay, so um, yeah, so QU will always be this modified different quotient today. Uh, e lambda will be the super level sets associated with this modified different quotient. Now, I'm just going to try to Curious to explain why this is a sensible statement um, in one dimension. So let's say U is smooth with complex support on the real line. And we wanted to see why one can compute the LP norm of U prime, the derivative of U, by understanding the limits of uh, lambda times the size of super level sets to the power one over P as lambda tends to infinity. So E lambda, if I write it up explicitly, it would be this. Um, the set uh, of all x and y where this quotient is bigger than lambda. Now I'm interested in what happens when lambda is large as lambda tends to infinity. 
But if we look at this definition of E lambda, remember U is smooth with complex orthogonal in particular, U is bounded. So the numerator is bounded. In order for this quotient to be bigger than lambda, y minus x must be really small if lambda is huge. And when y minus x is small, when I look at what is inside this set, so, uh, the, the modified difference quotient, you might suspect that uy minus ux divided by y minus x is almost like u prime of x or u prime of y for that matter, doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm going to say that this is roughly equal to u prime of x divided by whatever that's left, namely y minus x to the power one over p. So if you believe in this heuristic, then maybe the set E lambda is roughly the same as this modified set E lambda tilde, which is by definition, the set of all x and y, where u prime x divided by y minus x to the one over p is bigger than lambda. Okay. But the size of this E lambda tilde can be calculated very easily. Um, you just use Fubini's theorem, you integrate the characteristic function of the sets, but you can first integrate in Y and then you integrate in X. If you first fix X and look at the, the big measure of the set of all Y's for which Y minus X is bounded by uh, U prime X to the power P divided by lambda to the power P, uh, which by the way, uh, is just the, a rearrangement of the defining condition inside my set E lambda tilde. So I just raise it to power P, rearrange. Uh, I get to uh, this defining e equation for this uh, set. So what it is, well, you're looking at just uh, when X is fixed, you're just looking at an interval centered at the point X of this length, uh, well, of radius, of this, of this radius. So what happens is that the, the measure of the set is just twice the radius, uh, which is uh, u prime x to the power p divided by lambda to the power p. And now you can just multiply lambda to the power p to the left hand side, take one over p power. You'll notice that well, no matter what lambda is, lambda times the size of e lambda tilde to the power one over p is precisely two to the power one over p times u prime in lp. So if you really believe that uh, E lambda and this new modified set has roughly the same measure, then it might be plausible that um, as lambda tends to infinity as this approximation gets better and better uh, in the limit, you, you do that, that uh, this limit of lambda, E lambda to one over P being converging to something that has uh, to do with uh, your prime in LP. All right. So just a heuristic calculation that suggests that this is plausible. And also explains why we had to take lambda to infinity. Now, but more importantly, I would like to say a few words about how this modified difference quotient first arise. If we believe that, so we're back in n dimension, gradient of u of x is roughly like this difference quotient here. Then in order to express the gradient of u in LP using this difference quotient instead of the gradient, you might say, oh, instead of integrating gradient of u to the power p, I integrate this difference quotient to the power p. And uh, if you just think about it for a second, you'll realize it's not working because it doesn't scale. If you replace u by a dilation of u, it doesn't uh, scale the same way on both sides. So in order to reinstates the proper scaling, um, one idea is that maybe you should change the measure dy dx. You should weight it by this y minus x to the power n. And then you would uh, have something that is scaling like the integral of gradient of u to the power p dx. So if you decide to do that, then what you have here is the double integral of the modified difference quotient to the power p with respect to dy and dx. Um, this, uh, again, this the modified difference quotient. This is why you had to just have to have this factor y minus x to the power n over p. It is to make things scale invariant. Okay, so then maybe the next question they will ask is like, uh, well, this is how we, we end up with this modified difference quotient we had in the theorem. But in order to compute gradient of u in LP, 
maybe you could just compute the LP norm of the multiple different portions. Why not? Right? They're still the same way. But then if you fix x, okay, so let's say you fix x and look at the function, the extra weights they put in, the, the, the one over y minus x to the n over p. This is only a weak LP function with respect to y, but not an LP function in with respect to y. And for this very reason, if you take u to be, let's say, smooth with complex supports, then unless u is identically zero, um, you have no chance of calculating. I mean, the, the LP norm of the modified difference quotient is always going to be infinite. And as a result, you shouldn't hope to compute the gradient of u and LP by computing the LP norm of the modified difference quotient. It just doesn't work because the right-hand side is only, I mean, this, this LP norm of the modified difference quotient is always infinite. But the problem came from the fact that you have a weight that is weak LP, but not strong LP. So maybe it is not so unnatural to try to take the weak LP norm of the modified difference quotient on the product space instead. So maybe what you should be doing is that you calculate the weak LP norm of this modified difference quotient, which I remind you is the supremum of lambda times the size of a super level set to the power one over p, uh, the size of super level sets where q u is bigger than lambda. So maybe that's the correct thing to do. Now, we had our earlier theorem that says that the LP norm of the gradient of u is roughly the limit as lambda tends to infinity of lambda times the size of super level sets to the power of one over p. And of course, the limits of a function as a parameter lambda tends to infinity is bounded about by the supremum. So the supremum here is precisely the weak LP norm of the modified difference quotient. And then this is telling us that um, we have a lower bound for the, L, the weak LP norm of the modified difference quotient in terms of the gradient of U and LP. Now the question is, do we have to reverse inequality? Can we bound the right-hand side by the left-hand side? And it turns out the answer is yes. And this is the contents of the next theorem. So again, n is bigger than equal to one, p is bigger than equal to one, but finite. Um, we define this modified difference quotient as before for u that's smooth with complex support. Then one of the things we proved is that uh, the weak LP norm of this modified difference quotient is comparable to the LP norm of the gradient of u which in light of the previous theorem means that we had to prove that the left-hand side is bounded above by the right-hand side by some, up to some times too. Okay. So if I have time at the end, I would try to prove this for the case when n equals one and p equals one, which is the, the main case. All right, any questions so far? So instead of telling you the proof of the theorem, I would like to give you some applications. And these applications involve the space W11, um, the L1 norm gradient of U. The issue is that uh, you are computing an L1 norm. And as we know, L1 norms are sometimes bad in harmonic analysis, or at least they introduce interesting problems. So maybe they're not so bad, but they're borderline for many purposes in harmonic analysis. But in order to talk about these applications, I would have to first introduce Bessoff spaces, Bessoff norms, uh, fractional order ones, okay, on Rn. So let's say U is smooth with complex of four on Rn or Swartz on Rn, it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm going to only consider the case where S is between zero and one and P is strictly between one and infinity. Uh, you can ask what happens otherwise, but let's stick to this simple case, which is what we need. We're going to define the best of seminal uh, BSP of Rn by looking at 
um, by computing 2 to the js times delta j u, where delta j is an appropriate family of little payday projections on Rn. Oops, sorry. And you calculate the LP norm raised to power p, sum over j, and take one of p grid. So some of you might recognize this as BSP comma p. Uh, you have usually three exponents for uh, the best of norm, but I'm going to always take little LP norms of the capital LP norms. So the two will always be the same for today. So I'm just going to write BSP instead of BSPP. Now it is known that for this range of S and P, you can calculate this best of norm or seminorm um, by comparing it to the LP norm of this uh, function here on R2n. So what do you have? It is really similar to the modified difference portion we had earlier, except that this time, instead of taking ui minus ux divided by y minus x, I'm going to divide it by only y minus x to the power s, where s is the order that I'm considering, order of derivatives I'm considering in this best of space. So earlier we have one in place of s, now I have s which is between u and y. And I'm still going to throw in this weight here, y minus x to the n over p, just like before. So I'm going to compute the LP norm of this on the product space. It turns out that this is going to be comparable to the best of norm of u, except that the constants degenerates as s tends to one and zero. So incidentally, the idea of taking the LP norm of some sort of modified difference quotients actually works when you have a fractional order space. But this has been known for a while. Okay. So now we're going to move on to these three applications involving the space W11. The first one has to do with a fractional subgroup of embedding in one dimension. Now in Rn, so let's say n could be bigger than equal to one for the moment, we can look at subgroup of embedding for the space W11. It says that if I start with a function whose gradient of u is in L1, then I will be able to control u in Ln over n minus one. So I've drawn a picture here. Um, I'm going to put in green the hypothesis of my embedding. Okay, so I'm uh, given a function in W11. I'm going to put in blue the contusion of the embedding, which is Ln over n minus one. Now you might wonder what happens to embeddings into fractional best of spaces. So maybe it makes sense to uh, look at the straight line connecting the uh, green dots and Ln over n minus one, and look at the best of spaces in between. If you uh, consider scaling, then you're, you're led to believe that maybe if the gradient of u is in L1, then I can control the best of norm um, of u as long as s and p lie on this blue line, anywhere on the blue line. So it turns out that this is true if n is bigger than equal to two. It's been known for a long time uh, in, in the Russian community. Um, when talking to give a uh, more modern proof recently using Bourguin and Brissy's inequalities. So this is good if n is at least two, the dimension is at least two. But the situation changes in one dimension. Okay, so what happens? Now in one dimension, of course, this endpoint is going to become L infinity. So it's going to be, uh, so I'm plotting S in one over P here. So the points would uh, come to the origin, uh, which I think is on the next slide, yes. So in one dimension, of course, we still have this embedding that says that uh, you can control the L infinity norm of U down here by the L1 norm of U prime, this is just the fundamental theorem of calculus, at least for, things that, for functions that move with compact support. And then you might ask whether you have all the embeddings in between. So if your function has derivative in L1, 
does it mean that um, your function is in B S P where S and P is on this line? Well, on this line, of course, S is equal to one over P. So this embedding here turns out to be false for every P that is strictly between one and infinity. And this is the case in one dimension. Okay, so again, this is the inequality that is false for every P that is strictly between one and infinity. The left-hand side involves a Bessoff norm. So um, earlier we said that the Bessoff norm is comparable to the LP norm of this quotient here. Um, well, u y minus u x over y minus x to the power s plus one over p. But we are interested in the case where s is one over p. So uh, I'm going to just replace the s by one over p in this formula. The denominator become y minus x to the power two over p because it's s plus one over p, okay? So the best of norm b one over p comma p norm that uh, appears on the left hand side it's really the LP norm of ui minus ux divided by y minus x to the power two over p. Anyhow, the numerology is not so important, but earlier we said that uh, uh, we, we can't put the LP norm on, this, on R2 of this quotient on the left-hand side of this inequality. But maybe we can replace it by something smaller. And it turns out this is the case. So instead of an LP norm over R2, I'm going to take the weak LP norm of R, over R2. And if I do that, then this inequality will become a true inequality, at least for all functions that smooth with complex support on the real line. So the same function, but a different norm, and that would do the trick. Uh, this is going to happen many times today, like we replace the LP norm by the weak LP norm because it is smaller. Okay, so this is the uh, first result that solves for all the p that, that we care about, uh, certainly between one and infinity. The case p equals two was originally due to Greco and uh, Schiaterella, and <clears throat> it is what inspired uh, uh, current work. They were interested in um, showing that the uh, Poisson integral of um, a W11 function on the unit uh, on the on the unit circle is going to be a weak L2 function on unit disk. That's why they use this estimate. Okay. So that's the first application we have. And the second one has to do with Gardiano Lierenberg interpolation. So this time instead of having uh, a function just in W11, namely the gradient of U in L1. I'm also going to assume that uh, my function is in LQ for some Q bigger than equal to one but finite. Okay, so I, as part of my assumption, I have both W11 and LQ. So both of them are in green. And then the gardiano lierenberg interpolation theorem would say that for any S that is strictly between one and zero and one, you can control the BSP norm uh, as long as s and one over p lies on this line. So you have embedding into BSP for every pair of s and p on this blue line. Okay. So this is what happens when q is finite. And this works in all dimension. But the situation changes when q equals infinity. So when q equals infinity, this point becomes the origin. And we have this picture again. You have W11, you have a function in L infinity, but then uh, when you interpolate, you, you want to say that the function is perhaps in B1 over P comma P for every P that's strictly between one and infinity. But this turns out to be false for every P between one and infinity. So none of the things on the red line is going to be true. Okay, so we're going to fix this. Uh, same idea. This is the inequality that was forced for p between one and infinity. But this best of norm here, now we're in n dimension. So uh, it is the LP norm of instead of two over p, it is one plus n over p, where n is a dimension. 
of the space. And if you can't put the LP norm on the left-hand side, I'm going to put the weak LP norm and see what happens. And that works. So that's the content of the next theorem. Uh, it says that if you assume both u is in L infinity and gradient of u is in L1, then you can find this uh, quotient here in weak LP on the product space. And by the way, this corollary actually implies the previous corollary because when n is equal to one, then what you have here in the denominator is just y minus x to the power two over p, which is the one that we had before. And on the right-hand side, you would have a product involving L infinity norm of u and u prime in L1. But of course, the L infinity norm of u is bounded by u prime in L1. So when you apply this additional information that you have, you would recover your earlier corollary where the right-hand side says u prime in L1. And I thought I would try to say why this corollary can be proved using our results, um, well, at least briefly. So what happens? Well, this is the estimate we want to prove for every p that is bigger than equal to one and finite. Now, remember we had an earlier estimate, uh, weak L1 estimate, that says that if my function u is, uh, has a gradient that is in L1, then when I look at the set where u y minus u x divided by y minus x to the one plus n is bigger than some parameter capital lambda. I can bound it by one over lambda times this um, L1 norm of the gradient of u. So this is the weak L1 estimate that, uh, in, in the theorem that I haven't proved yet, but we're going to use it. And it turns out to be not so hard. You just play around with what we need to prove and uh, connect it to what you, you, you know. So in order to prove something about the weak LP norm of this quotient where the denominator is y minus x to the power one plus n to the power p, one plus n to the over p, well, you just look at the size of the super level sets for this function. It is not quite the other function, but you can do something to change it into the other function. In fact, you can raise the inequality both sides to the power p. And then the numerator would be ui minus ux to the power p. But that is bounded above by ui minus ux to the power one times twice the L infinity norm of u to the power p minus one. So um, if I then divide by the, this factor two times uh, the L infinity norm of u to the power p minus one on both sides, then we see that uh, the inequality on the earlier set is going to imply the inequality on the second set. And this is good because now I'm in the form of uh, where, where can I apply my earlier estimate? I just have to take capital lambda to be this fraction here. And then this is basically the end of the story. So it's really simple, it's just one line. And you just start to unravel the rest by rearranging the inequality. Okay, so yeah, don't worry about this. I mean, this is basically just telling us that uh, what we have proved with view this as a simple consequence. Um, and I would also like to uh, just mention a third and final application of the theorem, this time also about scalator Lierenberg interpolation, but this time we're not uh, with uh, LQ, but uh, we we'll start with W11 and interpolate with BS1P1, something like this, where S1 is strictly between zero and one, P1 is strictly between one and infinity. Okay, so somewhere in the open interior square that I have not drawn in the picture. Well, you might anticipate, anticipate the following inequality if your function is both in W11 and also in the space of space, then you interpolate whatever points on this blue line, you, you would hope to have uh, control of the BSP norm of your function U. This time it turns out to hold for every theta between C1 to for every point on this uh, blue line if S1 is strictly less than one over P1. So that means uh, I've drawn a dotted line here where S1 is equal to one over P1. That means if I have a point B S1 P1 that is below this dotted line, then I'm fine. I have interpolation for Galeada Lierenberg. But the situation changes if S1 is bigger than or equal to one over P1. So if I pick a point 
on or on above the started line here, BSP1, P1. Then when I interpolate, I don't get in something with BSP normals uh, under control. So again, this is the inequality that fails when S is bigger than equal to one over P1. But we can fix this uh, by replacing the left-hand side by something bigger. Left-hand side is the LP norm on the product space. Uh, it's comparable to that. And if we replace that by the weak LP norm, then the estimates becomes true. So pretty much the same story, but uh, a slightly different kind of inequality for interpolation between W11 and the fractional best of space. Okay. Any questions so far? Now, if not, I would move on to um, a perhaps even more elementary problem. So this time I'm going to compute the LP norm of a function in place of the gradient of u and LP. So I don't even take gradients, right? I just want to calculate the LP norm of a function uh, using these ideas. So, well, uh, what happened? Remember what we, we, we proved earlier, right? Like if we have this modified difference quotient, where I take the usual difference quotients, uh, we are divided by y minus x to the power one, and then I modify it by multiplying by this vector one over y minus x to the power n over p. Then the weak LP norm of the modified difference quotient is comparable to the LP norm of the gradient of u. Uh, and in computing this weak LP norm, I had to take the supremum of lambda times the size of a super level set to the power one over p. But if I take, instead of the supremum of lambda, uh, a lambda, the limit is lambda tends to infinity, then, then I will have a quantity that is comparable to um, the gradient of u and lp. Okay, so if I want to try a similar idea, well, I might not have to consider difference quotient, but for some other purposes, let's say if I really do want to do that, okay, then, uh, well, after all, the u in lp doesn't involve any differences, right? So maybe I, it is not so natural to consider difference quotients, but I want to try to draw an analog of what happens with the case when we had a gradient. So let's say we still want to consider difference quotient nonetheless, okay? Then, then since I'm talking about the zero of order derivative u, instead of uy minus ux divided by y minus x to the power one plus n over p, I probably should drop this one, right? This one here refers to the fact that I'm taking a first order derivative. So I should replace the one by zero, and this is the correct difference quotient to look at. And it is not so hard to see that if you look at the weak LP norm of this new difference quotient, where I drop the one power of one minus x in the denominator, you can bound it by the LP norm of the function u in Rn. Uh, this appears, for instance, in the paper of uh, Dominguez and Milman. Um, in fact, you don't even need the difference here. Like even if you had uy plus ux or absolute value uy plus absolute value of ux, this estimate would hold. Okay. So by having uy minus ux, you're actually making the left-hand side smaller. And then the question is whether you have the reverse inequality. Like, can you control from below this uh, weak LP norm of this function on the product space by the LP norm of u. This turns out to be possible, uh, which Ching Song group proved in a joint work. So uh, I'm going to have a set spread E lambda now, where uh, the uh, size of this new difference quotient is bigger than lambda. This is uh, the one y minus x to the power n over p without the one. Okay. And if I take the limits of lambda times the measure of the set to the power one over p as lambda tends to, oops, this is an important typo. Uh, wait, no, uh, wait, what should I do? Uh, I want it right here. So instead of infinity here, it should have been a zero, except that I seem to have, okay, wait, I seem to have lost the ability to, to write on the screen. Uh, when I chose the, the highlighting thing. 
Um, so what should I do? Uh, ooh, okay, anyway, this limit here is supposed to, oh, shit. This limit here is supposed to be a limit. It's not the tensor zero from above. And then in that case, we would have um, the, uh, the quantity that is equal to a multiple of the LP norm of our your function u. Okay. Uh, but this has to be under an important assumption uh, where u is an LP of our n, because for instance, if u is identically equal to one, then the size of Elan is always equal to zero, that that size is zero, but the right hand side here is infinite. So we can't have any, uh, any quality like this if you were not an LP to begin with. Okay. Now, all these make us wonder what happens now in the fractional case. Um, if we look at the weak LP norm, of this torsion here, u y minus u x divided by y minus x to the power s plus one over uh, n over p, where s is strictly between zero and one. What happens? Okay, if s were one, then we understood that it has to do with the gradient of u and lp. When s is equal to zero, it has to do with the lp norm of u. Uh, but what happens when s is strictly between zero and one? This quantity in general is smaller than the best of norm that we had earlier because the best of norm involved taking the LP norm instead of a weak LP norm. And this quantity here involving the weak LP norm over the product space arises in various substitutes when fractional sublet embeddings fail or these fractional Galliano Nuremberg interpolation inequality fail. So what else can we say about it? What's the nature of these quantities? And this is some ongoing job work with Andreas Sieger, Brian Street, and John and Tarpingen. So we clarify the role of this quantity. In fact, we provide two characterizations among other things. Um, so the first result is the Fourier analytic characterization. Now it relies on the following fact. Um, Remember the best of semi norm is this one. BSP norm of u is the little LP norm of uh, the little petty projection of u times two to the JS. Um, if you this order S, you take the little LP norm of the capital LP norm. But this best of semi norm could have been rewritten as two to the JS plus N over P times delta J UX and then you take this LP norm with respect to mu, where mu is the measure on the space, Rn product the integers. So what happens? Well, inside this uh, norm here, you have a function that depends not just on x, but also on j, right? j is an integer. And I could take the LP norm of this function on the domain of definition of this function, which is Rn product the integers. And um, in order to specify, so you have many layers of Rn. Uh, uh, this is Rn product, the integers. Um, each copy, each integer is going to specify one copy of Rn. So what happens is that if you take one measurable with one of the layers and take a measurable subset E of Rn, then I'm going to declare that the measure of this portion here, uh, namely E product with this uh, J, is going to be two times uh, to the power minus jn to multiply by the effect measure of e. Okay. So anyway, what so this this is a funny measure on the product space, but basically the idea here is that uh, instead of just the ordinary two to the js uh, delta j u, which arise because I want to take the s or the derivatives and delta j u is something that has frequency roughly two to the j. I would insert an additional factor here, depending on n and p, but change the measure. So that's these two, uh, the modification of your measure with the, with the uh, extra power of two to the j that you're multiplying, they are almost cancel out. In fact, the, 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 the proof that the, these two quantities are exactly equal, is just a fair line given here, but um, yeah, maybe for the sake of time, I shouldn't go into that. 
So you could somehow redistribute your weights and then uh, have an alternative formulation for the best of seminal. Okay. So the first characterization uh, we have for the weak LP norm of these modified difference portions of order S says the following. So let's say we're working with force functions on Rn. The weak LP norm of this uh, difference function involving an S order derivative is then be comparable to the weak LP norm of this function that we saw on the earlier page with respect to mu. So earlier, the best of norm was you take this function and you take LP norm with respect to mu. This time I take the weak LP norm. If I take the weak LP norm instead, then we get something that is comparable to the weak LP norm of this u y minus u x divided by y minus x to the power s plus one n over p. Okay, this how whenever s is strictly between zero and one, and p is strictly between one and infinity. Uh, mu is the measure that we had on the previous page. You could try to write this out very explicitly, and this is the expression that writes that. Um, I, I probably wouldn't say more than just that uh, you see that this quantity uh, instead of lambda, you have 2 to the minus j n over p lambda. Uh, well, its p power also occurs here. So somehow these two balance out each other. And then uh, this is the, the norm that you have on the right hand side if you want to be really explicit. And the idea of this distribution of weights also appeared in earlier work uh, on radial Fourier multipliers on Fourier restriction theorems with up by arc length measure on the curves. So um, something that, uh, uh, for instance, Andreas has used a lot with his collaborators. Okay, so this is one characterization. And using this characterization, we can provide another characterization uh, for these quantities that we have. So it is the same quantity, the weak LP norm of ui minus ux divided by y minus x to the power s plus n over p. And this is comparable to um, an interpolation norm of u between two spaces, two best of spaces. So what happens? Well, let's say we begin with um, s and one over p, okay? So s is strictly between zero and one, and p is strictly between zero, uh, one and infinity. So you have this blue dots in the middle. Okay, suppose you want to calculate the quantity on the left hand side. Then what you can do is that you can pick two points, BS1, P1 and BS2, P2 on this graph. So that your blue point is in the interior of the line segment connecting these two points, which is what the um, hypothesis on the left hand side here is saying. But you have to impose an additional condition on these green dots. You have to impose this um, hypothesis here, S1 minus S2 divided by one over P1 minus one over P2 equals negative N. But this quantity here is of course just the slope of this blue line. And you have to make sure that the slope is minus the dimension of your space. If you do so, then um, you could compute um, the, um, norm of u uh, in the interpolation space between bs1 p1 and bs2 p2 uh, with respect to theta comma infinity. So what I have here is the real method of interpolation with the uh, subsidiary parameter equal to infinity. Theta is of course determined by where your point is relative to s1 p1 and s1 s2 p2. Now I can write this right hand side out explicitly. Uh, the norm on the right hand side is this uh, norm that arises from the real method of interpolation, but the precise form is, uh, well, I, I wouldn't go more into that. So it's, yeah. it's just what it is. Okay. So finally, I would like to go back to the beginning a little bit. Um, remember, the, uh, we, we Look at this modified difference portion. This, this is the first order modified difference portion again, how you have power one in the denominator. 
uh, this is Q of U. And the LP norm of this Q of U is usually infinite. But its weak LP norm on R2n is comparable to the LP norm of the gradient U for P that is bigger than equal to one and finite. So I said earlier that maybe we could prove the case where n equals p equals one. Uh, this turns out to be the main case. Um, the case when p is bigger than one is actually easier. It follows effectively from the methods that you would use in this case when p equals one. And the case in higher dimensions can, can be obtained using um, a similar argument and also uh, the method of rotation. There's a lot of symmetry in this problem, so that's good. So let's just prove this for n in equal p equals one. And we only need to prove an upper bound of this form because the lower bound is uh, contained effectively in the first theorem that we saw today. So what happens? Well, when n equals p equals one, this power one plus n over p is of course just two. So I have this difference quotient where the denominator is one minus x to the power two. I'm computing the LP, the weak LP norm over R2, and I want to bound this by the uh, U prime in L1 oh, for the real life. Okay. So the proof is just one page on the next page, but it uses the Vitaly coupling lemma in one dimension. So I thought I would state that. Um, suppose I have a collection of intervals x on the real line where the lengths of the intervals are uniformly bounded above then by effectively a greedy algorithm, we can choose a subcollection y contained in x. So some subcollection of your initial collection of intervals. So that all intervals from the subcollection are pairwise disjoint up to endpoints. And so that every interval in your original collection can be contained in the dilates of one of the chosen intervals in your subcollection. So using this, the proof would be quite simple. We want to show that, let's say, when U is moved with complex support from the real line, and let's say lambda is positive, the size of the super level sets where this difference quotient is bigger than lambda is going to be bounded by one over lambda times the L1 norm of the U prime. Okay, so we have this set E lambda. This is a subset of the plane, oh, x and y. Now, if you have a point, maybe x comma y in the plane that is in E lambda, what I would do is to consider an interval from x to y, okay? So the collection of all such intervals where x and y is in E, this is a collection of intervals to which I will apply my Vitaly coupling lemma. Okay. So apply Vitaly coupling lemma to uh, this collection of intervals. Uh, it applies because every interval here has a length that is uniformly bounded above. Well, how do you see that? Well, if you have a point x, y in here, the length of this interval x minus y is going to be have a, having a square because you know you have this inequality here, right? Having a square that is bounded by, uh, oh, so maybe maybe instead of having a square, I should I should just say that uh, x minus y is bounded by u y minus u x divided by y minus x, uh, and then multiplied by one over lambda. I just rearrange, put one power of y minus x to the other side, and then divide by lambda there. But what is that? That is bound above by one over lambda times an integral from y to x of u prime. Uh, wait, hang on a second. Uh, except that I still have to divide by y minus x, or maybe originally I should have put this square on the right-hand side. Anyway, so what happens, you see that y minus x is bound above by one over lambda times this integral from y to x of u prime to the power one half, which is the first inequality here. And then you could enlarge this interval to the real line. So this is now a number that is uniformly bounded independent of what i you are talking about.
So now we can use the Vitelli Calfrey lemma and we will obtain a subtraction of intervals y contained in x. So that's all the intervals from this subtraction is pairwise disjoints up to n points. And every point i, uh, every interval r in x is contained in the dilate of this interval in the subtraction. So what happens is that, uh, well, i is contained in the dilation of one of the chosen intervals, then i cross i is contained in the product of uh, the dilation of these intervals uh, when you do it over your subcollection. But this is good because if you have a point x, y in E lambda, then in particular, let's say x is here, y is here, and then maybe x is on this side, y is on this side, you see that this square formed by x, y product with x, y is of course going to contain this uh, corner here. So the union of i product i over all the x is going to contain my e lambda. And now I've got a covering of e lambda. In order to calculate the measure of e lambda, I can just calculate the measure of the right-hand side. But uh, the, the j's are disjoint. So I could, I could have uh, taken the sum of the measures of the uh, squares 5j to the power 2. But then the 5 can go outside, and then I have a bunch of j's that are disjoint. And then, uh, the size of j can be bounded by the integral over j divided by lambda. I can sum things up because j's allow this joint. And then I would have that's just a multiple of one of lambda times the L1 norm of u. Okay, so this is uh, how you could uh, give a simple proof to this inequality using the Vitelli covering lemma. All right. So I would just make two closing remarks. The first one has to do with this, the, the very first result we talked about. So the very first result we talked about involves expressing the gradient of u in LP in terms of the limits as lambda tends to infinity of lambda times the size of the super level set uh, to the power one over P. So you express the gradient of u in LP in terms of a limit. But it turns out to be not the only way of doing that. In fact, 20 years ago, Borgang, Brisis, and Marinescu has proved the formula that's now called the BBM formula. And from that, you can also deduce that uh, the gradient of U in LP is equal to a multiple of the following quantity. So what is that? This time you take the LP norm over the product space of this difference quotient here. And this is a familiar difference quotient. It is almost the modified difference quotient, except that you don't have one power of y minus x in the denominator, you have s power of y minus x in the denominator. So the fractional case. And then you're supposed to multiply by one minus s to the power of p, and let s tend to one. It turns out to be exactly equal to just some multiple of the gradient of u in LP. Okay, so this is one funny connection to some existing theorems in the literature. And another connection to some of the work that uh, people have done as to the work of uh, Oscar <coughs> Dominguez and Mario Milman uh, last year, they have been able to put many of the results above in an abstract framework. So this is the result they have, for instance, um, Let's say X is a sigma finite measure space, let's say Rn. P is bigger than equal to one and finite. And let's say you have a family of operators, capital P sub T, of sublinear operators on LP of X. Then for every F in LP of X satisfying this condition here, uh, well, which says that TTF minus F in L infinity is bounded by some constant depending possibly on F, times t to the power of p for all t positive. So some sort of, uh, like, you know, if, if t, t of f is actually equal to f, then, then you, you might expect this to be true. It's some sort of Lipschitz continuity in the variable t as t tends to zero. Then if you look at e lambda, which is the set of uh, this quotient bigger than lambda on the space, this time capital X times the parameter space zero to infinity, uh, you take, uh, lambda times the size of this e lambda to run over p and let lambda tend to infinity. 
it will also recover the LP norm of your function on X. And with this, they found a lot of applications uh, from a characterization of the LP norm of the Laplacian of U uh, to um, relations between LP norm of F with level set estimates for three core averages of F for P bigger than N over N minus one, and then to other things like Gothic theory, et cetera. So uh, with that, I would conclude today's talk. Uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions and chat afterwards.